Can engineers deal with politics? This question calls attention to one of the core issues in engineering cultures, the relation between engineering work and politics. Arguably, most training in engineering draws a sharp distinction between the two. Work is good, solid, technical stuff, while politics is something that interferes with work. Engineers tend to speak of politics with disdain. But yet, politics always seems to be there. It's always around. In the last bit of material, we talked about a revised concept of culture being one that will help us understand differences among people. And we introduced the concept of the perspective as a means for distinguishing the patterns or identifying patterns and how people grapple with dominant images. Raising the specific question now, can engineers deal with politics, alerts us to a perspective that is widely and perhaps predominantly held by engineers, namely a self-image as purely rational problem solvers, whose rationality excludes politics by definition. Let us now briefly examine the self-image of the rational problem solver to call attention both to its presence as a perspective and to what it hides. No image sheds light on, light on everything. All images, even the dominant self-image of engineers, make some things visible while hiding or overlooking others. To examine this perspective, let us explore the views of John Sununu Sr., one of the most prominent advocates in the United States of the engineer as a rational problem solver. We will draw on two articles about John Sununu that appeared in Technology Review during the 1990s. Technology Review is a magazine published in Cambridge, Massachusetts that introduces its readers to current issues in technological development. One article is an interview with Sununu that was published shortly after he was fired by the first President George Bush from his position as White House Chief of Staff. The second is a column about Sununu's term written by Samuel Florman. Although the events described in these articles are now a bit dated, the lessons regarding engineers and politics arguably are not. Florman, by the way, authored many popular books about engineers and engineering. Initially trained as an engineer, he used the GI Bill after World War II to earn a master's degree in English literature at Columbia University. Supplementing his engineering work for a Manhattan construction firm, Florman became an in-house advocate for and a critic of engineers and engineering through such titles as the existential pleasures of engineering. So who was this chief of, chief of staff, John Sununu? As the interview explains, Sununu attended MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, where he earned engineering degrees, the bachelor's, master's, and PhD. He then worked in industry for five years, designing heat sinks for transistors and diodes taking a faculty position at Tufts University, where he also became Dean of the Engineering School. After serving on his town planning board, he ran successfully for the state legislature and then ultimately the governorship, where he served three terms and probably could have won a fourth. However, he decided to switch gears a bit and joined George Bush's presidential campaign. When Bush was elected president in 1988, Sununu became Bush's chief of staff. As Florman described him, Sununu was a brainy technologist, the kind of student, as an MIT professor put it, who comes along about once every five years. By moving through elective, elected office into the White House, Sununu, quote, had become a role model for the profession, one who spoke eloquently about the need for engineers to participate in politics, end quote. He aroused pride and excitement in a profession disgruntled with its lack of power, Florman continued, power and prestige. In other words, if John Sununu could do it, Florman says, perhaps the rest of us engineers could as well. Most of the engineer explored Sununu's views on public conflicts over environmental issues, especially global warming. Sununu combines, said the introductory summary, a powerful optimism about technology with an equally powerful distrust of government. He sees a lot in Washington that he doesn't like, especially the political influence of people and organizations who profess concern for the environment, 
but whose true mission, he contends, is to slow technological development and economic growth. Technology Review. The interview began with Sununu's conviction that environmental regulations sponsored by government are often unnecessarily harsh. He called attention in particular to the Delaney Amendment, which required zero emissions of certain materials if they had been linked to cancer. Pointing out how unreasonable was the requirement of zero levels, he elaborated further on the fact that too many people in government don't have a good quantitative sense. An intuitive feel, for example, of the difference between parts per million and parts per billion. To move from a standard of parts per million to parts per billion, an increase of three orders of magnitude would likely produce cost increases of way more than three orders of magnitude. The interview then goes on to articulate this sense of threat Sununu felt from people who are willing to make rash, rushed decisions based on little or no evidence, but on political or emotional arguments, as he put it. His main argument was that policies proposed to slow global warming were inappropriate until more and better research could be completed. He suggested that people concerned about global warming place so much emphasis on CO2 rather than on methane and nitrogen oxides because CO2 was most directly connected to economic growth, especially the burning of fossil fuels. Sununu played a key role in convincing Bush not to support the resolution to reduce CO2 emissions at the Earth Summit, also known as the United Nations Conference on Environment and Development, held in Rio de Janeiro in 1992. He pushed instead for something he called a comprehensive approach which would look at all relevant gases and issues simultaneously. In this case, a more comprehensive approach included a call for good data and an argument that any action based upon bad data would likely be a bad action. Sununu, for example, was proud of the fact that he argued for and won a billion dollar plus research program on global warming, including better climate models. He asserted that current models were not particularly good for predicting conditions in the past so they were unlikely to be much good in the future. He pointed out that they carried, over narrow assumption, uh, carried overly narrow assumptions, such as failing to take into account the thermal capacity of oceans. He concluded, quote, I am reluctant to set multi-trillion dollar policies to stop global warming based on computer models that have been unable to predict the past, end quote. When technology review pushed him a bit, suggesting that limiting CO2 emissions might be taking prudent safeguards, Sununu's response was, no, quote, prudent safeguards are what we are already providing with the Clean Air Act and some of the energy efficiency policies in the proposed national energy strategy, end quote. Furthermore, he cited a recent study indicating that a volcanic eruption in the Philippines was going to cool the earth for up to 20 years. So time was available to wait for better data. That no one at the Earth Summit in Rio addressed this study indicated the real issue. The real problem, according to Sununu, was these people called environmentalists. When we talk about this material in class, we, we play act a bit, eliciting colorful images of this problematic category of people from the point of view of the perspective that Sununu represents. What are environmentalists from this perspective? Students report that they are left-wing. They are commie pinko radicals. Notice, by the way, this accusation comes from the 60s since um, the Bolshevik communists uh, in the Soviet Union were known as the Reds. Anyone who was a little bit communist came to be known as a pinko. Environmentalists are tree huggers. Environmentalists are not to be trusted. As Sununu described them, they are anti-growth and probably anti-technology. Many en environmentalists, he said, quote, are looking not so much for energy efficiency as they are to stop development. In fact, a lot of the causes they have championed in the last couple of decades have had less to do with how to improve the environment and more to do with an anti-growth agenda, end quote. The technology review uh, interviewer responded, you seem to be suggesting a conspiracy. Is that it? There's a conspiracy? Sununu replied, no, no conspiracy. Quote, just broad disinformation and misinformed, emotionally inclined decision-making, end quote. 
This quote gives us some idea of the vigorous ways in which this perspective manifests itself. It's not an uncommon perspective. You have heard it yourself and perhaps you have performed some of it yourself as well. Sununu is identifying risks to rationality that live out there in the world of public decision making. The key argument here was that environmentalists are part of a larger category of people who seem to have their politics first and their facts or data second. In other words, the technical arguments these people make are founded or are grounded in some sense on a prior political position. They are people who do not base judgment on rationality, but on varieties of its opposite. This category, as the Sununu interview indicates, can extend into the press, into worlds of lawyers, and into the world of government bureaucrats. A lot, Sununu said, quoting, of what we have done in the past, in the last decade or two, has been dominated by emotional arguments with a large anti-technology swing to them, added and abetted by a press that loves to play that tune." End quote. Fortunately, Sununu reported, rationality is gaining strength. One more quote. As the global warming debate moves from the emotional to the rational, Sununu says, environmentalists are recognizing that things are not going their way. End quote. He was optimistic that somehow technical rationality would win out over emotional, politically based action. The interview concluded by exploring the possibilities and opportunities for engineers in government. Sununu argued vehemently that government needs participation from the problem solving professions, a term that included engineers as well as economists, but not lawyers. What we need to do is get rid of the lawyers in government and bring in technical problem solvers. 